Moorfield. I'm the director of the Elmer D. Wilson Museum, and I thank you all so very much for coming to our keynote lecture by Thatcher Hurd as part of our two-part exhibition, Good Night Hush, Classic Children's Book Illustrations. From June 23rd through September 10th, original illustrations by artist Clement Hurd, world-renowned illustrator of many children's books, including, of course, Good Night Moon and Runaway Bonnie, which are both written by Holland's alumna and perennial favorite, Margaret Wise Brown and published by HarperCollins, are paired with the work of contemporary children's book authors, Thatcher Hurd, Ashley, Ashley Wolf, and Ruth Sanderson, who Ruth and Ashley are also with us in the audience today. The second part of, part of Goodnight Hush and its related events will be on view in the summer of 2012, and will feature the original artwork exclusively from Goodnight Moon. The continuing celebration is the first of its kind to be offered in the Mid-Atlantic region with references to both the visual arts and literature through this exhibition's programming. Our hope is the Eleanor D. Wilson Museum will help children and parents explore how the arts on all levels shape families, generations, and communities. Of course, this exhibition would not have been made possible without the assistance of many organizations and individuals, so please humor me for a minute or two while I give my thanks. This is the thanks part of the lecture. I thank exhibiting artists and authors, Ashley Wolf. Ruth Sanderson and Thatcher Hurd for their faith in this project and unwavering support. Sincerest thanks to the Wilson Museum staff for their expertise in realizing this exhibition. Special thanks to Karen Hoyle and the Curlin Collection for allowing us to borrow several fine works from their collections, as well as thanks to Amanda Cockrell and Hollins University's graduate programs in children's literature. A special thank you to all the participants and organizers of this year's 2011 Children's Literature Association Conference. And I'd just like to raise a hand. If for those who are attending the conference, I'd just like to see who in the audience is with us today from there. Thank you all very much. It's been a pleasure getting to meet all of you over the past couple days, and I hope you're enjoying your time at Hollands. And of course, I'd like to also thank the Holland University Margaret Wise Brown Festival. We had a wonderful celebrity reading in the library this morning. We had close to 100 families come and hear Thatcher Hurd read some of his books and some of his father's illustrated books. Of course, this exhibition would not have existed without funding support from the following organizations. Uh, the City of Roanoke through the Roanoke Arts Commission, Roanoke County, and Wachovia, a Wells Fargo company. This exhibition serves as a kickoff event for a year-long focus on Holland's alumna and renowned children's author, Margaret Wise Brown. Please stay tuned for more events in the next year in celebration of her creative endeavors. If you go to the Holland's website and you just search Margaret Wise Brown Festival, you'll see other special programming. Now, I'm thrilled to introduce our special lecturer today, Thatcher Hurd. Thatcher, I thank you for humoring my cold phone call to you in 2008 pitching a wild proposal to pair the original artworks of his father, Clement Hurd, with his own and other contemporary illustrators' work. Thank you for believing I was not a solicitor that day and <laughs> hearing me out almost three years ago. Most importantly, thank you for allowing us to share these very rare and special works with the Roanoke community. Thatcher Hurd is a world-renowned children's book author and illustrator. Born in 1949 and raised on a farm named Peaceable Kingdom in rural Vermont, he is the son of popular author Edith Thatcher Hurd and legendary illustrator Clement Hurd. Continuing in the family legacy for writing and illustration, he attended the California College of Arts and Crafts, where he received his BFA in painting. Since the 1970s, he has written and illustrated more than 25 books for children, among them Mystery on the Docks and Mama Don't Allow, both of which were Reading Rainbow feature selections. Mama Don't Allow was also the recipient of the Boston Globe Horn Book Award. Additionally, Heard wrote and illustrated Art Dog, Moo Cow Kaboom, Sleepy Cadillac, Bad Frogs, and most recently, the middle grade level, level novel Bongo Fishing. He's also written and illustrated two board books, one of which, Zoom City, was the New York Times Best Illustrated Book of the Year. After the lecture today, please join us for a reception at the Eleanor D. Wilson Museum. Pre-signed copies of Thatcher books will be for available for purchase if interested. I also would like to invite you, if you are in the Roanoke area, on July 20th for a very special lecture by one of our other exhibiting artists, Ruth Sanderson, at 6 p.m. that night. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Thatcher Hurd.
wife says I bumble, so. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Margaret Wise Brown. But first, I would like to read something. Everybody can close their eyes. In the great green room, there was a telephone and a red balloon and a picture of a cow jumping over the moon. And there were three little bears sitting on chairs and two little kittens and a pair of mittens and a little toy house and a young mouse and a comb and a brush and a bowl full of mush and a quiet old lady who was whispering, hush. Good night, room. Good night, moon. Good night, cow jumping over the moon. Good night, light and the red balloon. Good night, bears. Good night, chairs. Good night, kittens. Good night, kittens. Good night, clocks. And good night, socks. Good night, little house. And good night, mouse. Good night, comb. And good night, brush. Good night, nobody. And good night, mush. And good night to the old lady whispering hush. Good night stars, good night air, good night noises everywhere. Nice book. <laughs> and she wrote it down and uh, read it over the phone to her editor, Ursula Nordstrom. And when my, my father was actually away in World War II in the South Pacific, and she kept it for him to illustrate. She had many illustrators who were doing, she was doing many, many books at the time. She did about 100 books during her lifetime, I think. And she kept it for my father and gave it to him when he came back for some reason. She specifically wanted him to look at the book. She was really interested in um, modern art, avant-garde art in those days. And my father had been studying in Paris, and he came back sort of infused with, he studied a little bit with Leger and some other French artists, and he came back kind of infused with that new ethic of art. And Margaret really wanted to bring that into books, do something totally new. Um, this isn't really going to be a lecture, I should say. It's more stories. but. Um, my father, one day, he went, uh, they lived in the summers in this place in Vermont, and they had, my parents, it has an attic which was full of stuff, and I never knew what was up there, but one day my father went up there and he came back down and he said, look what I found, I found the original dummy for Goodnight Moon, and Margaret's little handwriting, she had written it out in a little composition book, uh, I wish I had a picture of it, I'm going to show some slides in a minute, but uh, it was, sitting up in our attic for like 40 years. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he, it's at the Curlin Collection now in Minnesota. I, I kind of wish he'd kept it for me. I could have sent all my kids to college for that. <laughs> <laughs> and at the end, it was interesting, at the end, there's a little extra line that she put in, which was, uh, good night cucumber, good night fly. <laughs> doing things that were, she would do things that were completely random, and then she would realize they were random, and she would fix them. And make them. I mean, the way it ends is perfect, you know? It has an amazing, people talk about how it grounds kids in naming their everyday world, but if you really think about the book, it's much, much more mysterious than that. If you read a book just about kids naming everything in their room, that's not good night mode at all. It has many mysterious things in it. Uh, I'm not gonna analyze it too much, but, Good night, nobody. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Isn't that a way of taking a child's fear and saying, we'll just name it, we'll put it there. And then she, the way she expands at the end, good night to the old lady whispering hush, good night stars, good night air. What is more abstract than, I mean, there's this is such a, you know, these little tiny things in the child's room and then these huge abstract things. Good night noises everywhere. That is so sort of, ephemeral, I think. 
um, kind of like a, the pictures are kind of like a stage set, I guess you could say. I mean, I've been working on children's books for, since the 70s, and I just, her ability to put together words is sort of hard to imagine how skillful she was at it. I think it came to her automatically, but she had a way of writing that was, seemed so grounded and so complex at the same time. The rhythms of her books, if you really study them, they're not simple at all. Um, I'll read some more things later. So anyway, um, we went back to, I, I was born in Vermont in this house that my father bought in 1936, I think, for like $600. And they lived there until 1954, we moved to California. And um, we never went back to the original house. Uh, my father had lived there for about 15 years, but um, we decided, my father was ill, it was around 1986 or seven, he was ill, he had Alzheimer's, so he didn't come back. <coughs> my mother and I and my family went, and some friends went back to this house, which is near our present house in Vermont. And, um, we drove down this little road that I remembered. I'd only lived there just until I was five. It's in North Ferrisburg in Vermont, this beautiful house down by a river where I used to swim as a kid. And we went to this house and we, um, Mrs. Rao, the same person owned it who had, my parents had sold it to in 1954. And this was like 30 years later. And we walked in and the kitchen was a little different, sort of the same, but a little different. And then we walked up these back stairs, and in the bathroom was this pink wallpaper that my father had had made. He illustrated the only children's book that Gertrude Stein ever wrote, which mm -hmm. is called The World is Round. Um, it's, it's, I hated it as a kid. <laughs> I really couldn't stand that book. But it was an interesting, you know, they, they wrote, uh, William R. Scott in the 1930s, they wrote to all sorts of famous writers. I think Hemingway and Scott Fitz, F. Scott Fitzgerald and Gertrude Stein, and they said, would you write a children's book? And nobody wrote back, except for Gertrude Stein, and she said, I would like to write a children's book. In fact, I've already written it, and here it is. And then uh, my father was, they sent various illustrators art to her in Paris to see who she would like to have illustrated. And um, she wrote back and chose my father, and then he did the artwork, and they sent it to her in Paris. And it was all the finished art for the whole book, and the uh, customs called her up. This is a story my father told. The customs called her up in Paris, and they said, "Miss Stein, we have a package for you. And, uh, do you want to accept the charges? You know, there's a whole customs thing. So she went down. She said, well, I'll see what it is. <laughs> and she went down to the customs office, and she said, well, open it up for me. So they opened it up, and she looked carefully through all the pictures. And she finished, and she said, I don't want to send it back. <laughs> and then she went home. And she wrote my father, she said, I love the pictures, they're wonderful, they're exactly what I want. And she wrote him a very long, careful, you know, this is what I'd like changed. She insisted on having pink paper, the whole book is printed on pink paper, with, or pink ink. She insisted on having pink ink on it. Anyway, to go on to this, my original story. <laughs> so we, we go to the, first we see the bathroom, then we walk down the hall in the house, and we were, it, was, it was incredible because the house had not been changed in 30 years. There was a picture of my father's on the wall, wall watercolor he'd done, just sitting there. And then we got to the front stairs, which is, there was a stairwell, and um, he had taken in the 40s uh, first proofs, when the, when the proofs, big proof sheets come off the press, he had taken them and used them as wallpaper. They didn't have any money, so he used the proof sheets as wallpaper. And there was this uh, Goodnight Moon proof sheet, first proof sheet, sort of glued to the wall. Of this <laughs> and we were just amazed, but then the corner had been sort of chewed off. Some animal, this woman had lots of cats. This is wow, had lots of cats. And she had taken a, it was like, here was this Goodnight Moon proof with this little, Cover. She'd taken a cover from a cat magazine and pasted it. In. Anyway, but it was pretty, pretty amazing to go back to your childhood home and have it be exactly the same. I mean, usually they're either torn down or gone or something. But I remembered very distinctly uh, going to my father's studio. He had a studio. It was an old chicken coop that he towed up there from somewhere on Lake Champlain, and I used to go as a little, little tiny kid and. 
it, I think it's really what made me become an artist was seeing, just being in that world of my father working. All my life, I was able to just go to his studio and hang out. He wasn't into teaching. He didn't say, this is how you draw. He didn't give me any, you know, I wish he had given me more instruction or help or something, but I just would sit in his studio and watch him work. And it was really kind of that sort of feeling of what it was like to be around an artist that really convinced me to um, do art myself when I grew up. Um, I'm also going to show a picture of uh, Don Freeman, who was a great friend of our family. And it was the same thing with Don Freeman. When I was a little kid, he would come to visit. And he would dress like an artist. What I thought an artist dressed like a big overcoat. And he would wear a beret, and he would come with his trumpet to our house. He was, a, he was a big, booming, wonderful man. I mean, he's just such a genius. I love his books. Pat of the Met, Norman the Dorman. Corduroy is the one that people know now, but he did a lot of really amazing books. But anyway, he would arrive at our house in his big overcoat with his beret on. And he, would, uh, he would talk. I mean, he was a big talker. And he, not a big talker, that's not the wrong thing. But he liked to talk, and he liked to be the center of attention. Um, well, I guess I'll have to, <laughs> one time, my parents were also friends with Alistair Cook, and he, one time, Alistair Cook came for dinner somehow, ended up at their house in California, and Don Freeman ended up there too, and, after, and Alistair Cook was a vast ego. I mean, he, was, <laughs> he could talk all, you could sit all night and listen to him talk, and he would, you'd never get bored, but anyway, Don Freeman sat there and he, listened to Alistair Cook for a while, and he said, he sure talks a lot, doesn't he? <laughs> but he would, if, if Don got bored with the conversation, he would take his trumpet and go outside and play on the porch <laughs> until the night. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, I don't, I, I will make a confession, I was only three when Margaret died uh, in 1952, tragically. Uh, very suddenly she died. So I don't remember her, but we did visit, my parents did visit several times with her, and um, I'll show a picture in a little bit of her house there. Uh, when she was, um, she was had a relationship with a woman named Michael Strange for many years, and Michael Strange died, and um, then she fell in love with a man named uh, Pebble Rockefeller, James Rockefeller. He wrote a beautiful article about, from the point of view, I always saw Margaret through my parents' eyes, which was as artists and as sort of compatriots or whatever. And James Rockefeller wrote an article which was really a man just in love with her. And I wanted to read a little tiny bit of what he wrote <coughs> from an article and then tell a little story about Margaret and Fur. Margaret loved Fur. Remember, we are animals, she was wont to say. <laughs> Rabbits were a special totem. She had long eyelashes and would often accent her eyes to give herself an almond bunny look <laughs> when feeling mischievous. Many friends called her the bunny, and she often referred to herself as the bunny no good. <laughs> Went up to some lark or saying things like, I'm going to give all the bird brains egg cozies for Christmas. <laughs> There was a lot of fur around, a fur rug on the floor, fur on one of the couches, a fake leopard skin covering on the bed. She was very proud of the fact, this is 1950 or something, that the English queen mother reputedly kept her book, The Little Fur Family, on her bedside table. After a few days with the bunny, you weren't sure whether people acted like animals or animals like people. As one's eyes are drawn to those of a wild animal to gauge their intent, so mine would often gravitate to hers. There was always more going on in there than the viewer could ever grasp. The look would vary from youth to venerable age to childlike wonder. Mischievous, gaiety, mischievousness, gaiety, somberness, or the wisdom of a seer. No one will ever know my age, she laughingly said one day. How could they? It keeps changing. <laughs> so we went when I was about two, I think. We visited there, and Margaret told my parents that she lived on Vinyl Haven. This is the only house. She was on Vinyl Haven. You, the only way to get there was by boat. 
and she told my parents that you can tell the ferry the uh, guy who, the ferry captain when he went across Penobscot Bay that he could stop at a certain buoy, and she would send somebody out to pick us up. And they got on the ferry, and the ferry captain said, well, I don't do that. No. But somehow they convinced him to stop, and this person came out, and they sort of handed me over the side of this free <laughs> ferry. And we went to Margaret's for um, the weekend, like, or for a week or something. And uh, she didn't have kids of her own. It's interesting how many people who do great children's books don't have kids. <laughs> I see people nodding. Maurice Sendak, Beatrix Potter. Uh, Dr. Seuss didn't really have kids. Uh, anyway, she, so she was she was very attached to me. She I found funny letters she wrote to my parents before I was born, and she wanted me to be called Hiram, <laughs> <laughs> which is really I'm really glad that. <laughs> uh, I don't know where that came from. I even found a little card from her the other day in our, our some papers. She had given a little gift, it was like a little gift card, it said, for hiring from something better, you know. <laughs> anyway, so there we were at her house, and she had made a whole little dinner for me, some fancy little dinner, but I was like two. <laughs> and she didn't really have any conception of a real child, and what they would like to eat, or how they would do it. <laughs> and she, uh, then she had made a whole fur room downstairs. She would, you know, with like some, Tiger on the floor with her teeth and fur all around, and I would have none of it. As you would say now, I freaked out. So they said it was kind of a not a great visit because maybe I was the ruination of their visit. Um, you know, it's interesting. She was completely in touch with what a child. Uh, was concerned with and I mean, in a way that was so intimate. Um, I'll just read a little thing she wrote. Um, in 1947, 1946, the Book Week slogan, you know, Book Week, the slogan was, books are bridges, which was a phrase meant to help unify a world so recently torn apart by the Second World War. Margaret insisted, however, if I were a child, and so on a poster, books are bridges. I'd go out and make channels of diverted water from a stream through the sand and stretch the books across the little streams for my imaginary armies to travel across. If I were a child and read books are bullets, I and other children would throw them at each other. If I were a child and read books around the world, I would wish that I had gone myself. If I read friendship through books, I would have wished the book weren't there between us. Isn't that fascinating that she would think she could think that concretely. Therefore, the next year I propose books are books. <laughs> says, I would propose books are books for the Book Week slogan, a fact any child would recognize with relief. <laughs> okay, so I think we'll do some slides now. Before we get to the we do the whatever configuration of lights we're going to have. So this is my mother, writing in the 30s. She was in a wonderful, she really met Margaret at Bank Street College in New York, and they were in an amazing group of uh, people who were interested in writing children's books uh, at the, I think it was, what's it called, the Writer's Workshop or something, anyway. She said that Margaret used to come, they would, it was like a, sort of like a critique group. They would sit around and read each other's books, and uh, she said Margaret brought her dog, and um, the dog would sit under Margaret's chair. And if Margaret didn't like the book that somebody just read, she would sort of kick the dog, and the dog would like howl. <laughs> My father, uh, all, 
plein air in Vermont painting with a bow tie on. <laughs> Is that not the coolest thing? That's his dog, Greco. And this, Aww. unfortunately, the pressure of having some successful parents caused me to pick up alcohol. <laughs> I'm really a mess. I, you know, I actually, I looked at this closely today, and I actually think that is a beer bottle. <laughs> if you look down the left, that's my potty chair. <laughs> Which we still have. <laughs> um, and I really like the striped shirt a lot. I wish I had and the suspenders. Anyway, so this is the house in uh, Vermont that I was talking about that we visited. This is taken in the 30s, when my father first got it. Um, I was thinking it looked kind of like Al Capone was one of our... <laughs> <laughs> and this is the house in Vermont that we... When we moved to California, my father bought a, a all completely wrecked uh, farmhouse, a little further, sort of out in the boonies, and that's the place that we still go to in the summers. They did, he did endless years of work on the place. I was, um, they, when on the 50th anniversary of Goodnight Moon, uh, the ABC TV, like the big national whatever, wanted to do it. They did a little piece about it. And these, uh, you know, when you're out in the middle of nowhere in Vermont, you get really slowed down and you're calm and peaceful. <coughs> and two cameramen, uh, the cameraman and the interviewer showed up at, at this place on the front lawn there. And they, uh, they were like hyped up New Yorkers, and I didn't know what to do with them. And they, 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 I showed them around the house, and the guy said, okay, so where was Goodnight Moon Illustrated? Where did, you, where did your father do it? And I said, well, actually, it was not illustrated here. He did it in Connecticut. And the guy was just like, his face fell, and he was just like, let's get through this as fast as we can. <laughs> Goodnight Moon was not illustrated in this room. Okay, we'll do the interview as fast as we can. Anyway. This is Don Freeman I mentioned before, um, with his lovely wife, Lydia. And Maurice Sendak was a family friend for a uh, while. This was uh, right before he got to be famous in 1962 or three, I think. He was quite an amazing person. He is quite an amazing person. This is my parents later in life. We were talking about uh, Margaret dressing up, looking like, uh, making herself up to look like a bunny. Um, uh, by chance, Wally Shaw, the actor, the playwright, is an acquaintance of ours, and he said to me one time, he said, he knew my father, and he looked at me with this kind of intense Wally Shaw look, and he said, he said, Thatcher, Thatcher, you know, you know your, your father, he, he looks like a rabbit. <laughs> Absolutely true, and it completely changed my view of my father. <laughs> he really had, like, you can't see it in these pictures, but when you saw him in person, he had a kind of a bunny like look. <laughs> my mother also did lots of books with Margaret. They uh, wrote together uh, Five Little Firemen, a whole, they called them the Little Civics, Two Little Miners, and um, there was a funny story I read recently about. Uh, when my mother was living in San Francisco during the war, and my father was off in the South Pacific, and Margaret, uh, we call her Brownie, but Brownie came to visit, and um, she stayed with my mother for a while, and she, my mother said, well, let's start working on the Five Little Firemen. And Brownie said, okay, let's start working on the Five Little Firemen. So Brownie went in the bathroom, she poured her, she drew, drew herself a bath, and she sat in the bathtub and my, with the door closed. My mother was in the other room, and Brownie would call out lines that were to be put in the book, but she wouldn't say where they were supposed to go. My mother said they were brilliant lines, and they were wonderfully done. And anyway, this is my father in a good night moon room with, um, that we made for our, we used to have a company called Piece of Booking the Press. We did posters from uh, children's books. If, actually, if you see the, if you look in the exhibit, the Goodnight Moon picture that's in the exhibit, um, there's just one. Is, um, he, we had the idea to do a poster company, card company, 
and we told my father we'd like to start with Good Night Moon, of course. And he didn't say anything about it. He just kind of listened to us one night at dinner. And <coughs> this is my wife and I, Olivia and I. And a few months later, he showed up on our doorstep holding a thousand posters that he had had printed. And he did, what he had done was he created a whole original piece of art, which is the piece of art that's in the show, and then got it printed. And um, it's the only really piece of art that's like a complete <coughs> picture from Good Night Moon. The original art for the book was done using what we call color separation. So my father did black line art for the pictures, and then he indicated what the color should be and then the color was actually created by the printer in Hartford, Connecticut, or the printer's wife, I've heard. Anyway, here's Margaret. I've always had a terrible crush on her. <laughs> she looks different in every picture you see of her. It's fascinating. She really does look quite different in each picture. Here she is writing. This was for a wonderful article that was written by Bruce Bliven in Life magazine around 1950, I think it was. And she, she said she likes to write in bed with a quill pen, but it wasn't true. She liked to make stuff up. <laughs> and she said, no. And she said, no, no. And this is a letter that I have of, um, I just, well, this is a book called Wait Till the Moon is Full, which she originally wanted my father to illustrate, but for some reason, which always bothered me, she, she ended up giving it to Garth Williams to illustrate. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but you can see up in the right, she was very involved in her illustrators, and up in the right you can see she actually drew out what the picture should look like. Mm -hmm. And my father did a couple of gorgeous pictures for this book. And why she, I mean, I love Garth Williams, but it was just interesting that she but that shows you kind of her distinctive handwriting. And this is her in the only house in what she called her house in Maine. And she, that's her standing in the window. And she had this door in the house that was like the second story, but there was no railing or anything. She just, just opened the door and there was. <laughs> and there she is with, Jane Pebble Rockefeller, James Rockefeller. They went out, um, they were only together for a brief time. She, she died suddenly in France of a, um, she had an operation in France and they, she was, the operation was successful and she, it was time for her to leave this small hospital uh, run by, a, I guess it was run by a Catholic charity and, she was so happy to hear she was getting out of the hospital, she kicked up her leg and it released a blood clot to her oh, brain and she died instead. Oh, no. It was a terrible thing for everybody who knew her. All, all the illustrators were just, I mean, all, I mean, she had a large circle of friends, but particularly the illustrators were just devastated. She had a way of just getting really amazing work out of her illustrators. Uh, there was a story he wrote about, James wrote about, they went out sailing one day, they went from Vinyl Haven down to Hurricane Island in a little tiny dinghy that she had, that he didn't like the boat, but they went sailing and when they came back, a big storm came up and it started really blowing. And they were heading right towards Vinyl Haven and all of a sudden the boat just stuck its bow under. And it was a beautiful day, but it was very windy. And there they were sitting in this little dinghy that was like half sinking. <laughs> and Margaret said, she laughed and laughed and she said, is there any wine left? <laughs> and somebody came along, and a, a fisherman who knew them came along with his boat and rescued them, pulled them out of the water, out of the boat, and I guess towed the boat home. And the fisherman, uh, apparently a lot of fishermen had a big crush on her. Uh, he looked at her and he said, by God, Margaret, you look much better wet than you do dry. <laughs> This is uh, my parents with her, my mother and father, and with Margaret with a nice leopard skin fur coat. And a <laughs> And here she is with, I found this, uh, my mother had always told me this story, but I never knew this guy too. She had, um, it says, I found this picture in a scrapbook. It says, nothing and Brownie. And uh, my mother had told me this story that she and Brownie had decided to name a dog nothing to see what psychological effect <laughs> <laughs> and, 
<laughs> there she is, holding nothing. It might have, it might have also been her dog, uh, Crispian. She bought a dog, and she went down to see a litter of dogs, and she picked the meanest dog in the litter. She had an edge to her sometimes, and, and she, it said that she often had bills for, from vets and from you know, people who had been, whose dogs had been mauled by her dog. And her, her I wasn't good to beagling later, but. And there she was pushing me in a, in a little sled. Everybody in fur, you looking really happy. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a little later picture, this is going on more to my life. This is with my father at Christmas, and he's smoking a cigarette, which is very significant because the next picture is my father also smoking a cigarette in a Japanese newspaper. It's my father doing smoking a cigarette in a Japanese newspaper. Well, it was a big brouhaha, probably some of you knew about it, but Harper Collins called me up a few years ago and they said, uh, we have realized that your father is smoking a cigarette in the picture on the back of Goodnight Moon. Oh. And, yeah, oh. <laughs> I said, you know, anyway. So I said, no, I, you can't take the cigarette out. And then they called me back a couple months later and they said, could we please take the cigarette out? And I said, okay, take the cigarette out. So here he is with the cigarette, and here he is without the cigarette. <laughs> biceps in that picture. Yeah. <laughs> My father had really big biceps for some reason. He never really worked out. And his little nieces and nephews used to say, Clammy, show us your biceps. Show us your biceps. <laughs> anyway, um, let's see what's up to this. <laughs> we can do it all day. <laughs> This was my favorite book when I was a kid. I didn't really even, I don't think, knew that Margaret did it. I just love this book. It's a really, really great book. Um, I just wanted to make sure you one more. This is an example of Margaret's incredible writing. This is a sailor dog going to sleep in his little boat. He hung his hat on the hook for his hat and his rope on the hook for his rope and his pants on the hook for his pants, and his coat on the hook for his coat, and his spyglass on the hook for his spyglass, and he put his shoes under his bed and got into bed, which was a bunk, and went to sleep. <laughs> Try to write a, a paragraph like that. It's quite So when I started doing children's books, I was very much influenced by her. Uh, and I, one of the first books I did was called Hobo Dog. Uh. Uh, this is a long extinct book, but I did it for Scholastic. But I started, uh, Sailor Dog starts out, born at sea in the teeth of a howling gale, a sailor was a dog, Scuppers was his name. So I started my book. Born in a boxcar rolling west, the drifter was a dog, Hobo was his name. <laughs> and then I did a totally different book. <laughs> but, uh, it was, I was very much influenced by her. It took me kind of years to get sort of away from my parents, starting to do my own stuff. So this is just a few slides of my work. Uh, pea patch jig. I seem to always base things on songs. This is from an old song that John Hartford discovered, the great uh, Nashville musician discovered. Um, and I just started to get into much brighter colors than my parents. I don't know. I, I have something wrong with my eyes or something. What looks Doll to me looks bright to other people. I try to make the color as bright as I can. This is Baby Mouse in Farmer Clem's garden. She gets into all sorts of mischief. And this is Mama Don't Allow. Um, this book was really fun to write, but it took me a long time. I, uh, let's see, we're short on time. Anyway, I, 
I heard the song for years on the radio, and I thought that would make a great children's book, but I never could fit it together. I made a dummy for it, a little mock-up of it, and it wouldn't go together. It was like having lots of times the books for me are like jigsaw puzzles. I know the feeling of the book. I know what I want to express in the book, but I can't figure it out. So I put this book away for about a year, and then I brought it out, and it had all kind of worked itself out in my head, or in the file cabinet or something. And um, I put it together, but I had a really hard time selling it to a publisher. I couldn't get anybody to buy it. And I used to take it to schools, and kids just loved the book. So I thought somehow, eventually, it would get published, and it did. Editors changed at Harper, and the younger editor bought it, or the older editor had it. So here's some other pictures from Congo Wow. I wanted a little old lady on the back instead of a review, somebody saying, unbearable. <laughs> I hate this one. <laughs> There's the alligators dancing. Um, it looks a little out of focus, but on the right, you see those two guys in, they're a little out of focus for some reason, but uh, two guys in pinstripe suits. I found a great picture of Gene Kelly and Frank Sinatra in a Wesley <laughs> Berkeley movie. <laughs> And I turned them into alligators. <laughs> <laughs> and this is Art Dog. Art Dog was also really fun, but it took a long, long time. I worked and worked on the book. It was a completely different book. Book. I worked and worked on it, and eventually I came to a book that was called Ultra Dog. And I, I struggled with this book for a long time, and finally I made a little dummy for it. I showed it to my wife. Olivia and she uh, she like read through it very carefully, deliberately, and then there was like this long silence <laughs> at the end, which is an ominous sign for her. So I put it away, and I um, was like months later. I was driving down the freeway in Berkeley, and all of a sudden this thought came to me: What's ultra backwards? You can do it, kids. <laughs> art. Art Lou, but I left off the Lou part. <laughs> as soon as, it was interesting, as soon as I got the title, then it was like I just knew I had the book. It's like I had grabbed that wild animal by the tail, and it was going to be... And then it took, again, a long time to work it out, to try to figure out the story. So here he is, filling up his tank at the Acme Paint Factory in the Brushmobile. <laughs> if, you ever come to, if you ever come to Berkeley in California, go to the Berkeley Main Library in the children's room and you'll see a full-scale replica of Art Dog's Brushmobile. The kids <laughs> have it. Made by my friend, uh, uh, Stralatonic's husband. And here he is painting. To show you <laughs> The fun part of this book was adapting it, adapting famous paintings into dog paintings. <laughs> so this is kind of Henry Matisse. Late Matisse, late Matisse, I guess I should say. This is the board book, one of the board books I did. This is called Zoom City. It's the first time I really used the computer. I'm sort of sick of illustrating on the computer now, but I got into it for quite a while. Uptown, downtown, Zoom City, Zoom. Honk, honk, beep, beep, whiz, bang, kaboom. <laughs> and this is a more recent book, Bad Frogs, which I did for Candlewick. Uh, Unredeemably Bad Frogs. <laughs> Maybe that should be the sequel. <laughs> I had fun with her hair. This is, there she is again. This is, so this is sort of a mix of uh, working on paper, all the figures are drawn on paper, and then it's scanned in the computer, the backgrounds. A little bit like the way uh, Nuffle Bunny was done. Uh, and the and finished art ended up quite different from that, but bad frogs, very bad frogs. There's some, you'll see some of the art from this in the exhibition, but it's not the complete picture, so what you're seeing is just the artwork that I put on paper, so all the figures are in the uh, art that's on exhibit but the whole thing is sort of composited in Photoshop, so I don't have those. Staying up late, kissing their girlfriends. <laughs> when you read that to fifth graders or third graders, they really, they really like that. <laughs> Spilling the water out of the bathtub. Could they be good? <laughs> 
could they be quiet? They look like they're really trying hard. Could they dress up in tutus and dance in a straight line? Could they or would they? No way. So that's a first rough version of it and then a finished version. Nope, I don't think so. Uh-uh, not a chance. They'll be, the, I didn't show you all the pictures, but they'll be bad frogs forever. <laughs> and then this is uh, the new book. This is sort of my idea for the jacket for this new middle grade book that I did called Bongo Fishing. And there's the finished jacket. I didn't realize with middle grade novels, you kind of have to cede the territory, give up the territory of uh, the, the jacket of the book, the, the marketing people really take over with the jacket. I'm used to just doing the whole jacket myself, but I, I like this. So it's about a boy who's walking down the street in Berkeley one day, and a big object comes flying out of the sky, and it turns out to be a sort of friendly grandfatherly alien from the Pleiades driving a 1960 Dodge Dart. <laughs> I had a lot of fun with this book. It was a real learning experience for me because I had, or it was just a kind of a cathartic experience because I've been doing picture books, which is a very specific kind of form. They're a little bit like sonnets to me. And uh, to do a middle grade book, I said, well, I can throw anything I want in here. So I threw everything in that I thought of. And then, of course, I had to edit it and cut it out. Here's Lawrence Well, <laughs> 1960 Dodge Dart. I did lots of research on the net about Dodge Darts. And here is the evil psychiatrist in the book. He doesn't look too evil. It does look like uh, Freud, I guess. And there they are, actually, long ago fishing. So I guess that's about it for the slides. Just, can we have the lights again? Instead of doing it like in England where you ride on a horse, you run. <laughs> she, was, she was incredibly fit. And she had a lot of, uh, and then you chase after the rabbit and you try to get there before the dogs tear the, tear the rabbit apart. It's not a popular sport anymore. <laughs> but she, she had a lot of rabbit feet apparently. Margaret did. And so Bruce Blivin, who wrote the article for Life Magazine, said, um, Whenever anyone points out that beagling is an odd hobby for a girl who lives by writing books about the hopes and aspirations of small furry creatures, <laughs> Miss Brown, this caused a big controversy when she said this too, so Miss Brown is likely to encounter with, well, I don't especially like children either. <laughs> not as a group. <laughs> I won't let anybody get away with anything just because he is little. <laughs> anyway, so do people have questions? Yes? What is bongo fishing? <coughs> what is bongo fishing? I know, I don't really like the title of the book, but it wouldn't go away. So bongo fishing is something you do off in the Pleiades. So this boy goes on an adventure with these alien in, aliens off to the Pleiades, and they fish for bongo, bongo fish, but they don't actually catch them. So that's where it comes from. Not a single question. Yes? You once told me that uh, Art Dog was inspired by Harold the Purple Crayon. Art Dog was inspired by Harold the Purple Crayon, yes. Did you, did you also, I can't remember if you also knew or met. 
No, I never met Dr. Johnson. I think my parents do, but I never met him. Were there other um, authors that loom large apart from those who that influenced me? I think uh, mainly um, Don Freeman. Don Freeman, I really feel very close to Don Freeman. I mean, Don Freeman's work really resonates for me. Little heroes kind of solving you know, problems and getting to be heroes for it. That's, that's kind of the action pictures, kind of action books kind of what thrill me. Um, and of course, Sendak is uh, influences everybody. That was a great photo of that. Yeah. I had the good fortune once to have him critique Mamadou Lyal after it was published, uh, which was really hard, but it was really interesting. He critiqued my uh, line work in a way that was very hard for me to accept at the time, but he was totally right. And over the years, it really influenced how I worked. He just gave like two little comments. And, what elaborate? Elaborate on what you on what what said. What, what he said, said and how it changed your work. Well, he said I won't show the slides again, but he said your line work is too uh, monotonous. It's mm -hmm. all one thickness, mm -hmm. and and if you look at his line work, he's a master of the line goes with what's going on in the in the figure, and I could never begin to work like he does, but. Um, it was like he really he went right into it. He didn't. He, he zeroed in on that. It was very helpful for me to think about. It. It's about the lines. Yes. On that flip side of who's influenced you, what would you like to have your legacy be or resonate with other people? If they're taking from your work, what would you want it to be? I think it's just that. I mean, I, for me, it's it's that you can take your book and you can read it aloud to a group of kids in the school and they get into it. That's all that really matters for me. I mean, you know, you get involved in, oh, am I successful this way or oh, am I successful that way or did I get this review or that review? But when you sit down with a book and you know you've really got those kids excited, uh, that's what it's about for me. That's really, that's not a legacy, but that's just what it's cool to do. That's right back in there. Um, I haven't read Art Dog yet. Although I plan to now. Um, but it's got me thinking about other books that are for children's audiences that are in some way about art. Um, the Rylance, All I See, The Name When They Started, etc. Do you think those books are useful in getting kids to think about art, think of themselves as art, artists, etc.? Or is it just. In, in the hands Picture books that are that are the self great art are those more important? I don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> well, I do know that in the hands of a good art teacher, books like Art Dog and When Picasso Met Matisse mm -hmm. and um, you know and Monet's Garden, so in the hands of an art teacher, art teacher can take those and translate those into something that the kids really get into. I mean, with Art Dog. I, been to a few schools where they took the idea of turning famous paintings into dog paintings and they had the kids go and look at paintings and turn them into their own paintings into dog paintings. That was great. Yes? Um, I'm curious because the theme of this conference is revolt, rebellion, and several other <laughs> words like that. <laughs> 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 I don't know the exact <laughs> ones, but I, I wonder, um, you're <coughs> clearly um, fits into that, and I wonder. Um, if you might elaborate on um, on whether that's something that you um, that you think about as an artist and as a as a writer of um, of you know creating a certain kind of child or also you know just the bad frogs as a as a parent I think oh we really want kids to read bad frogs <laughs> yeah I actually think I think the book didn't do well because parents didn't want the kids to read the book called bad frogs. The kids, it's, they, they, somehow parents think that if they read a book called Bad Frogs, it's going to turn your child into a bad something. It's like books about homosexuals. It's like, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it, yeah, I mean, I think rebellion is what, I mean, is it kind of what kids books are about. I, I uh, certainly, it's, I was a very unrebellious child. I was like a good child. I was not a child alcoholic. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, 
I was I'm rebellious, and I think that. But if you get in touch with that kind of little part of yourself, it's like really, you know, wants to get out in the world and so forth. It's, yeah, that's really the. It's very important to me. Yes, absolutely. Yes, right here. Associated your work with music and songs, um, and I know you were. Mention of Resendak, and I've heard that he often time would listen to music while he was illustrating. Does music enter into your creative process in the sense I know you draw on songs sometimes or incorporate music into the plots of your work, like Mamba and Laos, so on and so forth? But do you, does music infuse your work in other ways? Yeah, I, I uh, am a frustrated musician. I always want to, I wanted to be a rock and roll musician when I was in high school, and I played in bands. And um, I had a band called the New Tokoloma Swamp Band. <laughs> but I, I do get infused, as you say, with the rhythms of it. I find listening to music and really sort of, you do put yourself in an altered state in which the music is driving your inner sense of sort of excitement about something, and you get into sort of a hyper. It's almost like a, I don't know what the word is, like a kind of hyper ego state where you're like, this is the greatest thing that's ever been done. If you're not really thinking that while you're working, people, other people are not going to be excited about the book either. So music is definitely part of it. Yes, way in the back. Um, I have a question about the two different versions of the Runaway Bunny. Yes. And I noticed, for instance, in the last picture, in the original, the bunny is still outside, but in the revised version, he's well inside the tree, safe and sound with his mother. Um, could you talk a little bit about why that book was revised in terms of its picture? Why was it redone? It was redone because um, it was originally published in 1942 in the color separations. My father did full color art, but the uh, ability of printers to do full color art in those days was not good. And they really did kind of wreck the printing of it. So in 19, the early 60s, or some nurse, or nurse, they, wrote, they wrote to my father and they said, would you like to re-illustrate the book? So he went through and re-illustrated uh, the whole book, and it was reprinted. And um, there's a sweet letter from Ursula Nordstrom that she wrote to him. And it, it's a wonderful book, if you haven't seen it, by the way, called Dear Genius. <laughs> letters of Ursula Nordstrom, it's full of riches. I mean, it's got a letter in there to my father in which she says, I'm sitting at my desk with big tears in my eyes because this is so beautiful. So they just wanted to do it right. I don't know why he changed the money. Yes. Um, I wonder if you talk a little bit about art influences. You talk about children's writers, but um, in terms of straight up arts, um, are there any particular artists or movements that, that you particularly um, inspired you? Um, I'm inspired by all kinds of people. I was very inspired by Vermeer when I was in, when I was in art school. I was like a sort of had a very split brain. On the one hand, for a while, I would do very s serious sort of Renaissance painting stuff, still lifes based on Vermeer. And then I would have this sort of doodling part of my, I would do etchings that were completely free form with no real anything to them. And I couldn't quite combine the two. Uh, but I'm really inspired. I just love seeing, if any of you have not, are not from around here, you haven't seen the Winston Link Museum here in Roanoke, it's a fantastic. Museum. There's a lot of photographers I'm interested in. I always revere Edward Hopper. In Art Dog, I changed every famous painting into a dog painting. Every painting you see is either like a Surat change into a dog painting or a Picasso change into a dog painting. Except at the end, Edward Hopper. Cape Cod Morning, I could not turn into a dog painting. Like <laughs> Edward Hopper was my god, and I couldn't, you know, I think Edward Hopper is one of the great artists of all time. So, anyway, yeah. Uh, what would you say, what would your advice be to an aspiring illustrator who's just trying to get into the business of children's illustration? To get into the business of children's illustration, um, <laughs> find a good program and go to an art school if you're starting out. Uh, you can get involved in an organization called scbwi.org, which gives good advice. It's from mainly unpublished writers, gives good advice about um, getting published. And beyond that, put together a portfolio of of artwork that you think is really strong, and then get up your gumption and make appointments with uh, art directors in New York and take it to New York. Start out by illustrating other people's books. The way to start is to illustrate other people's books. I will say, that said, I will say it's a very difficult time for children's books right now. 
picture books are really having a struggle. Um, all the electronic media coming in, with the chain stores in trouble, even the chain stores in trouble, not to mention all the uh, great bookstores that are in trouble. So it's, it's a tough time. But there are illustrating jobs. There's always illustrating jobs. Yeah, right here. I'm really interested in how, how you think of color because I've, I've seen the, the slides you just put up and I've seen thinking of like, the focus and the French modernists and it's, it looked, the color looks like it's missing and I know you're talking about how you see things much brighter than others do. So how does, how does your color theory work? Do you, do you think of the colors first for the painting? Do you think of the story first or do you have a certain palette always in mind? I don't have a palette in mind. I like to, um, I do have a mood in mind. I always think of a mood first when I'm thinking of them. Uh, so it's kind of a matter of um, thinking of what feeling you want to do. And then I don't think of a color palette. I've tried doing that. I've looked at books of color palettes. Oh, I'll use this palette for, the, for this book. It doesn't work for me at all. I just have a desk with a whole bunch of different watercolors, gouache, chalks, pencils, everything out on it. And I just kind of grab whatever's in hand. There's no theory to it at all. But I do like to see, I took a wonderful course right after college called the Joseph Albers Color Course, which is an amazing training. He was taught at Yale for many years, aside from being Joseph Albers. And he um, had, an, it's an incredible course to tune your eye up to color. And for me, it was just like, just set me off and got me really into. I, I just, I find it fascinating to take a, palette of colors and say, if I put this color with this color, it'll make it look really bright. And then I'll see if I can push it even brighter. Um, I mean, I'm not crazy about bright colors in other people's stuff particularly, but I just like to do it my own stuff. If I was a rock and roll musician, I'd play really, really, really loud. <laughs> collaborative stew, um, and yet looking at picture books that I've seen um, in, on sale here and so on, you, you were primarily alone, and I'm wondering if you could talk a bit about contemporary collaborations that you yourself are involved with, um, or have you turned away from the idea of living in that kind of community that your parents included or part of? Um, I don't think it's quite as vibrant as when they were there, they were working. Uh, when they were starting out, it was a little tiny group of people around the publisher that was unknown, really about Scott books. So there was a lot of natural collaboration. Margaret was an editor, she was a writer, she was sort of everything at William Mark Scott. So it's a less of a collaborative atmosphere now, and the publishers um, don't encourage it collaboration. I think it's completely insane. I don't know why they don't. I think, you know, if you were writing an opera with somebody, you'd be spending six months together and you'd fuss and feud and fight and create something great, but they don't do that anymore. I don't know why. They don't even let an artist, an author, know where the illustrator lives. <laughs> they say, oh, well, you might fight. I mean, my parents are always fighting with Margaret. I mean, you know. So, but I, for myself, I have illustrated other books for people, and I had a lot of fun recently. I did a book, uh, which I didn't show pictures of, called The Weaver, which I've been working on the text for years. And Elisa Claven illustrated it. She's a good friend of mine in Berkeley. So I would tend to collaborate with somebody I knew. Um, but I just, I like the control. I just, I like the idea that I wrote it, illustrated it, if I want to change the text or take the whole book in a totally different direction, I can just do it. So, yes? You know when um, an artist and a writer collaborate, like, is it possible? Um, or is it just kind of This is getting a little technical, but if you want to do a book, do, listen carefully, do not get your friend to illustrate it. <laughs> Very big mistake. Unless your friend is Maurice Sendak. <laughs> okay? The publishers will literally not even look at your book because they've had a lot of trouble with that. Say, they, say you, you wrote the book, your friend illustrated it, they loved your friend's illustration, they didn't like your uh, book, and you get into a big so I think that looks like. Thank you all so much. <laughs>